I'm here to talk about success. Right? Now let me get right away to the first rule of success. The first rule of success is to have a vision. You see, if you don't have a vision of where you go, and if you don't have a goal where you go, you drift around and you never end up anywhere. It's like you can have the best ship in the world, you can have the best airplane in the world. If the pilot or the captain doesn't know where to go, it would just drift around. It would not end up anywhere or most likely in the wrong place. So I was very fortunate that I stumbled onto my vision. I mean, as you know, I was born in 1947 in Austria after the Second World War. And I didn't really like Austria when I grew up. I couldn't wait to get out of there. I couldn't see myself becoming a farmer or a worker in a factory or anything like that. Even though my parents wanted me to stay there and have a normal life. My father wanted me to become a police officer like he was. My mother wanted me just to stay there and marry a girl and have a bunch of kids. But that was their vision, not mine. My vision was totally different. I felt that I was born for something special, for something unique, for something big. So I was searching. Then one day I went to school. I remember I was 11 years old and they showed a documentary about America. And all of this stuff and I said to myself, that's where I want to be. I don't want to be around here with these little farmhouses and these little buildings and everything is old. I want to be in America. But now the question was just how do you get to America? In those days, it was a very expensive trip. It's not like today. So again, very fortunate. I was very fortunate that one day after school, I walked by a store in Graz. And it was the only store that really sold kind of American stuff. So I went inside and I looked around and I looked at this stuff and then I saw a magazine. I saw a bodybuilding magazine that had Reg Park on the cover. Reg Park was then a three-time Mr. Universe. And I saw him on the big screen as Hercules. And on the cover it said, how Reg Park, Mr. Universe, became the Hercules star. So I looked at the cover and I said, I got to get this magazine. So I bought the magazine, I took it home and I read it over and over from the front page to the back. It had everything in there, how he trained, how he was working out in Leeds, England in a factory town, how he worked out every day for three, four hours and became the strongest man of Europe, and how he won Mr. Europe, Mr. Great Britain, and then eventually Mr. Universe, and how he won the second Mr. Universe and the third Mr. Universe, and how he was discovered to play the starring role in Hercules. I read that and I said to myself, wow, this is the blueprint for my life. This is exactly what I want to do. I want to become a bodybuilding champion just like Reg Park. I want to get into movies just like Reg Park. And I want to make millions of dollars and be rich and famous just like Reg Park. Do you know how great it felt that I knew where I was going? Imagine the majority of people don't know where they're going. I knew where I was going. So it was just a question of how do you do it? I was so relieved because when you have a goal, when you have a vision, everything becomes easy. So I knew where to go. So people always ask me, when they saw me in the gym in the pumping iron days, they said, why is it that you're working out so hard? Five hours a day, six hours a day, and you have always a smile on your face. The others are working out just as hard as you do and they look sour in the face. Why is that? And I told people all the time, I said, because to me, I am shooting for a goal. In front of me is the Mr. Universe title. So every rep that I do gets me closer to accomplishing that goal, to make this goal, this vision turn into reality. With the age of 20, I went to London and I won the Mr. Universe contest as the youngest Mr. Universe ever. And it was because I had a goal. And this is no different than anything else, what I'm talking about. This is not just about bodybuilding. It was the same in acting. And the same thing is also in politics. 
I remember that in politics, I had a very clear vision that I will be the leader of California. This is as far as I could go because I was not born in America, so I could not run for president. So being the governor of the fifth largest state was for me really the ultimate title, the ultimate accomplishment in politics. So even though people came up to me and said, why don't you go and run for something smaller, you're never going to make it. I ran for governor and then two months later I became governor of the state of California. Again, because I had a very clear vision what I'm going to do with California. So let me tell you something, visualizing your goal and going after it makes it fun. You got to have a purpose no matter what you do in life. You got to have a purpose. So that's rule number one, have a vision. Rule number two is, don't listen to the naysayers. Everything I ever did, the thing that I heard out of people's mouth was, that's impossible. That can't be done. Or oh, no. I remember when I want to be a bodybuilding champion, including my parents and everyone else around me, said this is impossible. That is exactly what I heard. And of course, I proved to the people that it can't be done. So whenever someone said to me, it can't be done. I heard it can be done. When they said no, I heard yes. And when they said it's impossible, I heard it is possible. Because I am a strong believer. I'm a strong believer what Nelson Mandela said. That everything is always impossible until someone does it. Well, I'm going to be the one I said to myself, I'm going to do it and I'm going to show it to them. Maybe it has never been done before. That's perfectly fine with me, but I'm going to do it. And I did not listen to the naysayers. The same was also when I went into not just the bodybuilding, they said no. When I wanted to come to America, when I wanted to go to America, they said it's impossible. It's, there's no money that you have to fly even over there. You have no money when you go over there to live with. And what do you think? They're going to wait for you. They have plenty of big bodybuilders over there. It was all no, no, and it can't be done, it's impossible. And I remember then that the same thing happened also when I'm in the show business. I won 13 World Bodybuilding Championships all together, and now I said to the agent, the Hollywood agent, I want to get into movies. He said, <laughs> that's funny, Arnold. I ask a studio executive, I say, I want to get into movies. I want to be a leading man. He started laughing. So they all say it's impossible. I said, why is it impossible? He says, because look at how big you are. You weigh 250 pounds. Hercules bodies and muscular bodies weighing 20 years ago. And then they told me, he says, and your accent, even if you reduce all your body weight and everything and have a normal body, I said, your accent, I mean, it will go give people goosebumps with the German accent. It will get people the creeps. They will get scared. He says, no one in Hollywood ever has become a leading man that had an accent. This is the kind of stuff that they heard. They said, no, you see, it's impossible. And plus your name, your name, who can pronounce Schwarzen Schnitzel or something like that? No one can pronounce it, so forget about it, Arnold. This is the kind of thing that I heard. Now that's very encouraging, isn't it? But you know something? I didn't give a shit. I said to myself, in bodybuilding, I worked out five, six hours a day. I'm going to do the same thing now for acting. And of course, I went to college to study English, accent removal, acting classes, and all of this stuff, all day long, I worked and I worked and I worked. And within a short period of time, I made one movie called Hercules in New York, which of course went right into the toilet. But it didn't discourage me. I still had the same vision. And then all of a sudden, I was asked to star in Conan the Barbarian. And after I did Conan the Barbarian, the director at the press conference said to the press, he said to the press, if we wouldn't have had Arnold, 
we would have had to build one. And the same thing was with Terminator. After we were finished filming Terminator, Jim Cameron said to the press, if Arnold wouldn't have had that accent and talked like a machine, I think the movie wouldn't have worked. So think about that. The body and the accent that they attacked was an asset. And the next thing, the third point that I'm going to make to you is work your ass off. There is no magic bill. There is no magic out there. You cannot get around. You have to work and work and work. And it drives me crazy when people say they don't have enough time to go to the gym for 45 minutes a day and work out. Or to do something for 45 minutes to an hour a day to improve. If it is physically improved or if it is mentally to improve. Imagine you read one hour a day about history. How much you will learn after 365 hours in one year. Imagine if you will work on the business, on some business that you want to develop every day for an hour. Imagine how further along you will go and get. So it drives me nuts because we have, when people say we don't have the time, we have 24 hours a day. We sleep six hours a day. So it gives you still 18 hours. So there's someone shaking their head out here in front to say probably, I don't sleep six hours, I sleep eight hours, right? Or just sleep faster. So we have 18 hours a day. The average person works around eight to 10 hours. So let's assume it's 10 hours, so we have eight hours left. Then you travel around an hour a day, maybe two hours a day. So now you have still six hours left. What do we do with the six hours? Then we eat a little bit, then we schmooze a little bit, talk a little bit to people and all that stuff. But you can see how much time there is available if you organize your day. So you got to work hard. I mean, let me tell you something, when I went to America, I went to college, I went and worked out five hours a day, and I was working on construction. Because in those days in bodybuilding, there was no money. We didn't, I didn't have the money for food supplements or anything. So I had to go to work. So I worked on construction. I went to college, I worked out in the gym and at night from 8 o'clock at night to 12 midnight, I went to acting class four times a week. So I did all of that. There was not one single minute that I wasted. I became very friendly with Muhammad Ali in the 70s. And Muhammad Ali worked his butt off. And I saw it firsthand. And I remember that there was a sports writer that was there in the gym when he was working out and he was doing sit-ups. And they asked him, how many sit-ups do you do? And he said, I don't start counting until it hurts. Now think about that. He doesn't start counting his sit-ups until he feels pain. That's when he starts counting. That is working hard. And so you can't get around the hard work. It doesn't matter who it is. Well, I hate plan B. <laughs> but when you start doubting yourself, that's very dangerous. Because now what you're basically saying is, is that if my plan doesn't work, I have a fallback plan. I have a plan B. And that means that you start thinking about plan B and every thought that you put into plan B, you're taking away now that thought and that energy from plan A. And it's very important to understand that we function better if there is no safety net. I'm telling you, 
I've never ever had a plan B. I say I made a full commitment that I'm going to go and be a bodybuilding champion. I made a full commitment that I'm going to be in America. I made a full commitment that I'm going to get into show business and I'm going to be a leading man. No matter what it takes, I will do the work. I will do the work over and over and over until I get it. And the reason, one of the main reasons why people want to have a plan B is because they have worried about failing. What is if I fail, then I don't have anything else? Well, let me tell you something. Don't be afraid of failing because there's nothing wrong with failing. You have to fail in order to climb that ladder. There's no one that doesn't fail. Michael Jordan said in one of his interviews, when they said, you are unbelievable, you're the greatest basketball player of all times. I mean, tell me about that. And he says, well, you just mentioned the successes. But he says, for me to become the greatest basketball player, I missed 9,000 shots when I was playing basketball at the NBA games. Does it make him a failure? No. He's one of the greatest basketball players of all times, but he failed 9,000 times. Do you get it? We all fail. It's okay. What is not okay is that when you fail, you stay down. Whoever stays down is a loser. And winners will fail and get up. Fail and get up. Fail and get up. You always get up. That is a winner. That is a winner. This is one of my six rules to success. You can only feel complete as a person if you think about what can you do for your fellow member around you that maybe needs help. I, I was an immigrant going to America and I saw how America was the most generous country in the world. I mean, they opened up their arms to me, they helped me, they invited me for Thanksgiving dinner, the people, they brought me, uh, the bodybuilders in the gym brought me plates to my apartment because I had no plates, I had no silverware, I had no bedware, I had no pillows, I had no blanket, I had no TV, I had no radio, I had nothing. They brought it to my apartment. And I said to myself as an immigrant that is being embraced with open arms, that I need to go and make sure that I give something back. And this is when I started feeling obligated and I said to myself, so what can I do? I'm a bodybuilder, what can I do? Well then I realized when I saw Special Olympics that I can help and train Special Olympians. And so we started getting involved in Special Olympics and in no time I proposed to them to start powerlifting in Special Olympics. And it became the number one sports in Special Olympics, powerlifting. They always have a packed hall of 5,000 people. And I became the national trainer and the international trainer of Special Olympics. And I tell you, I felt so good. I felt better than winning a bodybuilding competition, going to one of their competitions and seeing a hundred of those athletes from all over the world competing in powerlifting and being happy and being included, in being felt that they're equal to all of us. It was the most unbelievable feeling and this is why I got so excited about it that then after that, I started you know, going around to military bases in America and training our military personnel. Because in those days, bodybuilding and weight training wasn't popular, now it is. Now when you go to Iraq, back that or something like that and you see the American soldiers train they have the biggest facilities it's like this this dome here this is how big the facility the training facilities are now so I went from military base to military base to train the soldiers and the sailors the airmen and all of them the more I got into that the more I realized how good it feels to give something back and that's when my idea came about about after school programs because after school when I traveled to all the schools to train the students I saw there was a huge gathering of students after the school was over outside the school. And I asked the school principal, 
what are all the students doing? He said to me, Arnold, you have to understand that 70% that the kids in our schools, they come from parents where 70% of the parents are both working. So therefore, there's no one there picking them up. So that's got me the idea to start after school programs, to keep those kids in school while the parents are working and to offer them homework assistance, tutoring, sports and fitness programs and arts programs, music and painting and so on. And it became a huge success. Then of course when uh, 2003 happened, where there was a governor's race in California, I said to myself, now is my chance to jump in there and to really give everything. And people said to me, he says, are you crazy to run for governor? When you're governor, he says, you cannot go and make movies anymore. I mean, I know that, that you can't run the state and make movies. Of course not. He says, well, you would lose all these millions of dollars. I mean, you're getting 20, 25, 30 million dollars a movie. You will lose that. I say, I don't care. I say, all the money that I made is because of America. My success is because of America. Everything that I've accomplished is because of America. I say, so for me now to give something back for seven years and not to make money makes no difference to me. I say, I'm going to do it. And I jumped in the end of the race and did it. And let me tell you something. I'm not poor because the seven years I didn't get paid. I'm perfectly fine. And it made me feel good that I could give back, give back to America. Well, I think that every day we are benefiting from someone helping us. That's why I said earlier, there is no such thing as a self-made man. I mean, when you think about it, you're born and you need your parents to raise you. You need your teachers to teach you. You need your coaches to do sports. And so when I think about back of the people that helped me, I remember that everything I did I always needed help. Think about it when someone says, Arnold, you're the greatest self-made man. I said, you can call me anything you want, but don't ever call me self-made man. I said, because I did not get to that point by myself. I mean, think about just to be successful in the movies. The only one that makes you successful in the movie is, is the people that go to see the movie. So how can you say to yourself, made man, when you need millions and millions and millions of people all over the world to go and see a movie? So people then the press looks at it and says, this guy is a big box of his success. It's the people, it's you. Imagine if Jürgen and I both think that we're self-made people and this hall right now is empty. No one here. Do you think this will be a successful conference? No. Who makes it successful is not him and me. We are just one little molecule that is added to the equation. But you are the ones that make this conference a successful conference. So thank you all of you for being here today. You are the ones that is making it big.